Early on in the Anglican mission, um, we began to understand and we began to articulate um, one of the core values of the mission. And that core value is this, that the local church is the primary unit of mission. That your church is the primary unit of mission in the kingdom and in this thing that we call the Anglican mission. The leadership of the Anglican mission absolutely owns this value. In fact, the leadership of the Anglican mission has structured, resourced, encouraged in every way that we know how, and we keep praying daily for more understanding in this, how to release the local church to live more fully and more passionately for Jesus Christ where you are. That's the heart of what we long to do. We have very intentionally created space. We do it through our networks and everything we do so that the local church might actually go before the living God and pray and dream and actually go for it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That is our passion. In 2005 in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at a winter conference there, we had a number of amazing speakers and among those was the Reverend Dr. Edward Stetzer. The reason I say it was amazing is because what God did during that time in Myrtle Beach was in a unique way knit the heart of this mission to the heart of Ed Stetzer. I mean, maybe it was his passion for Christ that was so clearly kind of communicated in his talk. Maybe it was his passion for planting local churches. Whatever it was, he came out of that 2005 winter conference and began to work revitalizing and helping us plant churches all across the United States. And so today, Ed Stetzer is back with us. He is totally committed to church planting. He's helped plant churches and revitalize churches all across the United States. He is currently planting a church in his spare time, which is not much. He is currently planting a church in Hendersonville, Tennessee. He has written numerous books. He's taught at seminary. He has written all kinds of articles on this core value of the local church being the primary unit of mission. And so what I would like you to do with me in just a minute is to welcome Ed back. But in addition, I would like you to kind of take a moment right now and just go before the living God and say, Lord Jesus, in the power of your spirit, if there is anything that I need to hear, anything that I need to understand, anything that I need to take away from this talk that would just kind of move the mission of our church, my church, a little further down the field, a little further into the kingdom, then Lord Jesus, may it be so. Ed, would you come up and talk to us? Well, good morning, and thank you so much for having me, and, and uh, what a wonderful, wonderful gathering. God's being glorified through worship. We're encouraging one another, provoking one another, Hebrews 10, 24 says, to, to love and good deeds. And my hope today is that I can encourage you in engaging all of God's people in mission. And thank you so much to the, the bishops and leaders that have invited me, honored to be here. So let's begin by jumping into our Bible and begin to look through some passages. If you have a Bible, take it out. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, repent and uh, look on with a friend who does. And uh, we'll look through together at uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to work through a text if that's okay today. Uh, a little later on, I'll do some seminars. We'll walk through some data, things of that sort. But, but I want to walk through a text today that's really been on my heart. And, and I hope and pray can be an exhortation to you where you are as a mission, but also where, as, as, as TJ mentioned a minute ago, where you are as a church. Ephesians 3.10 says, God has chosen the church to make known his manifold wisdom. It is the tool, it is the vessel, it is the instrument for God's kingdom agenda in the world. And yet the reality is, is we all know, we are all aware of the fact that in many churches, most people are, or maybe more people than should be, are passive spectators rather than active participants in the mission of God. And that's what I want us to look at today. 1 Peter chapter 4 is going to be our text, and we're going to look through uh, verses 8 all the way down through verse 11, and I'm going to focus in on verses 10 and 11 today. Is, uh, you're, I know some of you are looking up on the screen for the words, and I don't have them there because I like you to kind of work it through with me. And so let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. It says this, above all, I'm reading from the HCSB version, it says, above all, 
Keep your love for one another at full strength. Since love covers a multitude of sins, be hospitable to one another without complaining. It goes on, verse 10, it says, Based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, his speech should be like the oracles of God. If anyone serves, his service should be from the strength God provides, so that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Pray with me. Father, speak to us through your words. Shape us to think about your mission and your people engaging in the mission as Scripture describes. Father, we're challenged because the practice in our churches and the passage that describes our churches are often a far distance from one another. Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit and by our fidelity to your word, help us to bridge that gap between this passage and our practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And this passage is just that. It's a challenging passage when we look at the state of the church in North America. We could say the world, but let me specifically talk about North America because I have some statistics that I'll quote to you. Right? I'm the president of Lifeway Research. I do statistics a lot of each day. So every time I quote a statistic, an angel gets its wings. And so let me share with you just a few statistics that will help us to shape that conversation today. Matter of fact, I won't give, here, here's just a broad identification. Here's what we found. In the study we did that Tom Rayner and I did in our Lifeway research team, we studied 7,000 churches from all different denominations in and, 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 and North America. And, and in doing so, what we discovered, and there were churches, there are Anglican churches included in this sample, as well as many other denominations. What we discovered in, in contacting 7,000 churches, the largest project of its kind ever done, is several things, and I'll talk about a few of them. But one of the things that disturbed us was this is that the majority of people in the majority of churches are unengaged in any meaningful mission or ministry. Let me say it again so you don't miss it. The majority of people in the majority of churches were unengaged in any meaningful ministry or mission. And when we look at that, it concerns us because what that tells us is is that our churches are too filled with passive spectators rather than active participants in the mission of God. And so I'm encouraged and thankful that the organizers today asked me to speak about how do we get all of God's people involved in God's mission? How do we get all of God's people involved in God's mission? And 1 Peter points us to that very thing. Now let me say a few things before we even walk through the text, which we will do it together, is that this text is written to believers. It's important that we remember that because if we read the text and or we read it to and before non-believers, and we say to them, your role is to get busy, start volunteering, uh, start serving, then what we've done is we've taught them to turn over a new leaf when what they needed was to hear about new life. And the distinction is important. Christianity is not, it's not I, the idea of I would try harder. Christianity is not the idea of I'll work my way through volunteerism to please an unhappy God. Listen, the gospel is not you do, it's Jesus did. And so in understanding that, it shapes the way we think as we move forward in understanding this passage. So this passage is written to believers But in being written to believers, it speaks to some of the challenge that believers in your church and mine perhaps have experienced. And that challenge is, is too often our churches are filled with passive spectators rather than active participants in the mission of God. Now, this ought not to be. It ought not to be from Scripture. We see it. And the distance between this passage and our practice is striking. Listen to verse 10. Based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We know this not to be the practice in so many churches, perhaps yours, perhaps mine. And so how do we move people from being passive spectators to active participants in the mission of God? Well, let's take a look through the passage to gain some guidance along the way. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Here's what it says. It says, above all, keep your love for one another at full strength. In the original language, full strength here points to like an athlete exercising or, or working on skills. We, we exercise to, to, to be better at certain things. And the scriptures tell us to keep our love for one another at full strength. Now, I'm a believer in exercise. I actually exercise about three hours a week. And I know what you're thinking. You're doing it wrong. But actually, I'm not. Since I spoke to you in the EMEA meeting in 2005, I'm, I've actually lost about 100 pounds. Kind of a backstreet boy is gone, and so I'm excited about that. Um, 
But, but what I would say to you is this, this passage reminds us of the importance of the spiritual practice of engaging in strength building or service building exercise. It tells us keep your love for one another at full strength. Since so that's that exercise. But love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. So it calls us to love and to show hospitality. And then the subsequent verses show how. Let's walk through that together. There are four things if you're jot, jotting down notes, I want to encourage you to jot down. Here's the outline I'm going to give you. We can walk through it together. It's simple. Number one, all have gifts. Number two, God intends all to use. Number three, for which he empowers us. Number four, to bring God glory. Let's walk through them together. The first thing I want us to see is this. Number one, that all have gifts. All have gifts. Look at verse 10. It says this. Based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others. So there's a tie that comes with faithfulness, fidelity, being faithful to our call, our new life in Christ, involves using the gift that God has given us. Based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others. The scripture teaches it, but we know it from our church traditions as well. Matter of fact, the 19th article of the 39 articles begins by saying this. It says, the visible church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men. So what then does a congregation of faithful men and women look like? Well, in one way it looks, it's filled with people who are obedient to the scriptures. And the scriptures say this, based on the gift they have received, everyone should use it to serve others. Now let's walk through that little by little. So it says first, based on the gift they have received. Based on the gift they have received. What what does this mean? Well, let's take it little by little. First, based on the gift they have received starts with the idea that they've received a gift. And based on that gift, we're to minister within the gift and the gifting that God has given us. And this is important, and I want you to notice it says, based on the gift they have received based on the gift they have received. I'm not trying to sound like a preacher in the South. I'm trying to emphasize the past tenseness of this word, right? Based on the gift that in the past, written to believers, they have received. Sorry, how else do you emphasize the past tenseness of the word? You're in Greensboro. People get used to it. I'm not a Southerner, but I, I, my daughters are. I live in the South now. I'm, I'm from New York City, born and reared just outside of there, but I'm, I'm fixing to fit into Tennessee where I live right now. <laughs> it has not been without challenge, and you all can understand what I'm saying. And if you've got a problem with that, my people will talk to you. Um, so the idea here is I'm not emphasizing the, 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 the word simply to say receive, duh. I'm trying to emphasize that, that you as a follower of Jesus Christ, having been made new in Christ, Jesus calls it being born again, but having been made new in Christ, you have received a gift and gifts that flow out of that. And in the normal practice of the normal Christian life, you and I would be using those gifts for God's glory based on the gift they have received. And it says everyone. Now that's the word that messes me up. Because it says everyone should use it to serve others, but the reality is, is in most churches, it's the minority of people are using their gifts to serve others. But the Bible says everyone should use it. So I had to dig deep, right? I, I, got, I got into the Greek, the original language that the New Testament is written in, and I, I dug deep, and I looked it up. I used my, my Bible dictionary, and then I used my computer programs, and I looked it up because I really wanted you to get the background of what this word means because it's amazing what it means. Are you ready? Here's what the word everyone means in the original language. Are you ready? It means everyone. <laughs> See, I know what you were thinking. There had to be a trick because, because your practice and my practice is such a, such a difference between this passage and our practice that maybe this word doesn't really mean everyone. Sometimes in the Bible, all doesn't mean all. But everyone means everyone. And when it comes to the people of God who have been redeemed by the power of the gospel, made new because of Jesus' death on the cross for our sin and in our place, that part of living out that new life is that everyone should use it to serve others as good stewards of the manifold or the varied grace of God. So what then does this mean for us? 